midst of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you are fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued, and you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me, they make mouths at me, they wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord, let him deliver him, let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Let's pray together. Father, I pray tonight that you would give us imagination, Lord. Help us tonight to hear our Savior's cry from the cross and to see what was done for us and for your glory. Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son, and we pray especially tonight that you would, as it says in the Psalms, open up our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of your law as we spend time together tonight in Isaiah 53. Lord, help us again to see, to, to perceive, to hear as if we were there. And again, as if even maybe for the first time that, Lord, even though we, we do this every year and this is an annual ob observance for us, I pray, Father, that we would not um, approach it in a cavalier manner. Lord, help us to be awake spiritually, to be receptive, and again, above all else, to see our Savior hanging there for our sins. Father, may it lead us to repentance tonight and a renewed commitment to follow Jesus with all that we have. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Who has believed that we have heard from God? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form of majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with griefs, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Would you stand with us? Now my debt is paid, it is paid. 
precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me, whom the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. Say, now my debt is paid. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our, through for our transgressions. He was cru crushed for our iniquities. Um, the chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Then he'll call me 
someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living for the wrongdoing of my people to whom the blow was due? And his grave was assigned with wicked men, Yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth.
to say my lips shall still repeat Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the plunder with the strong, because he poured out himself to death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors.
Can we pray together? Father, again, we do ask that as we go through the remainder of this evening, that you would give us imagination, imagination enough to see and to behold and to ponder the sight of our Savior on the tree for us. Help us, to, help us to see your greatness and your glory vindicated in his death and our sins punished and forever forgiven. And while we cannot be there physically, may our hearts tonight be at the tomb and at the cross. May we wonder, repent, and give thanks for the gift of your Son and his death. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This is one of the um, more somber sermons that, that we'll have because a lot of times if, if you do use your imagination and you, you think about what must have been going through the disciple's mind, the person in whom that they had put all of their trust and all of their hope had just died. And Jesus surely had told them several times what was going to happen and that, that he was going to have to go to the cross. And he told them what was going to happen later, but they didn't get it. They didn't understand. And it seems that over and over again, as Jesus continued to try to remind them, just, just their, their density in comprehending what it was that was happening there on the cross was something that it's, I probably would have been there too, had I been there. This wasn't a mistake. This was something that God had planned long ago. We've been looking at Philippians on Sunday mornings, and in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, it talks about Christ and talks about what he did, and it says, Although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. And being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. See, this, this was a plan. Jesus was God. He was in the beginning with God, and he was divine. And he took the form of a servant for us in obedience to the will of the Father. And it wasn't a surprise, it was a plan from the beginning. In fact, if, if you look at Acts chapter 2 and you look at Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, he talks about this and he says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan, the predetermined plan and the foreknowledge of God. You nailed him to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. This idea of Jesus being a servant and taking the form of a bondservant, it's part of the predetermined plan of God. And we see that all the way back in Isaiah chapter 53. And it really kind of starts at the end of Isaiah chapter 52. There it says, behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. And then at the end of Isaiah chapter 53, it calls him my servant again, and it kind of brackets this whole chapter to tell us about the things that this servant of the Lord would do says, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. So we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 53. We're going to take a look at four things that we can see about the Lord's servant. And the first one there is that he was scorned. He was scorned. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised. We did not esteem him. And when Jesus came, the nation of Israel rejected him. The, the revelation here in Isaiah 53 
It says the revelation that the arm of the Lord that would deliver the Lord's people is met with shock. It's met with astonishment, distaste, dismissal, and avoidance. Such a one as this can hardly be the one who can set us free from that most pervasive of all human bondages, sin and all its consequences, to a world blinded by selfishness and power. He doesn't even merit a second thought. Isaiah says, there was nothing about his appearance that we would be drawn to him. He was an ordinary looking guy. It wasn't anything about the way that he looked. It was who he was. And it is what he came to do. In Matthew 26, we can see that the, the leaders, the elders, the scribes, chief priests, elders of the people, they were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas, and they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and to kill him, not during a festival. Otherwise, a riot might occur among the leadership. They rejected him. He wasn't the kind of Messiah that they were looking for. They didn't know what they really needed. They thought they needed deliverance from Rome, and they needed something much deeper. In Matthew 27, he was scorned by the soldiers. Soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium, gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. They stripped him. They put a scarlet robe on him. After twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him, took the reed, began to beat him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off him, put his own garments back on him, and led him away to crucify him. Well, the Lord's servant wasn't only scorned. He was our substitute. And it says this in verses 4 through 6 of Isaiah 53. 5 and 6 in particular. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, we're healed. Each of us, like sheep, have gone away. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. You see, he was, he was our substitute. Scripture in 2 Corinthians, it talks about how he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Christ, on the cross, bore the sin of the entire world. It's like the serpent that was lifted up in the wilderness. Maybe you remember the story. There were serpents that were going through the camp of Israel and they were biting people. And all they had to do, Moses made a, a stick and put a bronze serpent on it and they had to glance at the serpent. The thing that was biting them, the thing that was causing their death, they had to glance at that up on a pole. And the serpent reminds us of the first serpent in Genesis 3 that deceived the woman and created the, the opportunity that sin entered the world. And just like looking at, at the serpent on the stick was, was something that saved them from their serpent bites, Looking at Christ on the cross, he became the sin that bit each one of us. And looking at him in faith for what he's done and what he's accomplished by, by paying for that as he became sin on the cross for us. That's what saves us. That's what justifies. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In 1 Peter, it says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds, you're healed. And this, of course, is a demonstration of, of God's love. This is how God demonstrated his love towards us because while we were sinners, Christ did this. It wasn't while we were friends. It wasn't while we had a friendly disposition towards him. It was when we were his enemies and when we were sinners. And, and Jesus himself suggested that this is the greatest love that somebody can have for somebody else. No greater love has anybody than this, that they lay down their life for their friends. Well, the servant wasn't only scorned and he wasn't only our substitute. He was silent. 
He was silent. He didn't defend himself. Now, this doesn't mean that he never said anything during his trial or when he was being led away. He did. The Gospels record some things that, that he said, but he didn't defend himself. We see that he did not open his mouth like a lamb led to slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. And Luke, he's before Herod. Herod was very glad when he saw Jesus. He'd wanted to see him for a long time. He wanted to see some, some magic tricks. And he was hoping to see some sign. He questioned him at some length, but Jesus didn't answer. He didn't, he didn't do anything that could have defended himself during this trial, which was full of injustice. In John 19, 4 through 11, he's before Pilate. Pilate came out again and said to them, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you so that you may know I find no guilt in him. Jesus then came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold, the man. So when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out saying, Crucify, crucify. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and by that law he ought to die because he made himself out to be the son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. And he entered into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus didn't give him an answer. So Pilate said to him, you do not speak, you do not speak to me. Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and I have the authority to crucify you? It almost feels here like Pilate's on trial not Jesus. It really does. Pilate says, I have this kind of authority. And Jesus says, you wouldn't have any authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Again, in, in a different gospel, in front of Pilate, Pilate questioned him and said, You're not, don't you answer? See how many charges they're bringing against you? They're accusing you of all of these things. But Jesus made, made no further answer. Jesus wasn't trying to defend himself. He wasn't trying to get out of what had been foreordained from him or planned for him from before the foundation of the world. This was the predetermined plan of God, and God the Son was going to go through with it. And First Peter says, while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. So our Lord's servant, he was scorned. He was our substitute. He was silent. And he made a sacrifice. He gave of himself. In Isaiah 53, 10, the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself a guilt offering, he will see his offspring he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. In Hebrews, it puts it this way. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. Mic drop. Cleaned out the old leaven, it says in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 7 and 8. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, our Passover has been sacrificed Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You see, Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he celebrated a Passover meal with the disciples. And, and we're going to do communion here in just a second. And the idea of this Passover harkens all the way back to Exodus. And in Exodus chapter 12, in, in verses 21 and 22, the, the instructions for this were given, and, and Moses called for the elders of Israel and said, go take for yourselves lambs according to your families and slay the Passover lamb. 
You take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood which is on the basin, apply some of the blood that's in the basin to the lintel and to the two doorposts, and none of you shall go outside the door of this house until morning. And you see, this is before that 10th plague when the angel of death was going to go through Egypt, and anybody that wasn't in a house that was covered by the blood of the lamb was, was going to suffer the wrath of that judgment. But because of the blood that was put there on the sides and on the top, if they were in that house, the angel of death would pass over. That's why it's called Passover. And Christ was our Passover lamb. It says in Romans 5, 2, through him also we have our access by faith into this grace, the state of God's favor in which we stand. You see, Jesus died on the cross for my sin. My sin put him there. He did that willingly. He was a sacrifice for me and for you. And he bore the sins of the entire world. And at the cross, he said, to Telestai, paid in full. That, that Greek word has a, has a perfect tense to it that indicates an action that was taking place at one time that has ongoing results. And in old Greek manuscripts, they found it written across bills that had been paid. So to Telestai, what he said from the cross, it's a statement that the price that he paid on that cross paid it in full. We're going to go to communion now. We're going to take the opportunity now to celebrate a Passover with Christ. And so I'd like to invite the men to come forward. And as, as we have the, the bread and as we have the cup, I want to encourage you just to, to contemplate, to think about the sacrifice that Christ made on our behalf and how the disciples might have felt based on seeing their hope be put into the grave.
I'm going to ask Clovis, one of our elders, to say the prayer for the bread. Holy Father, <clears throat> as we come before your presence, we come to worship you. We come to give praise to your great name. We come to bow before you and recognize who you are, the eternal God. We stand in amazement. We stand in wonder that you would so love your fallen race that you would be willing to make provision by giving your only son to die in our place as our substitute. We're honored, Lord. We're privileged to be children of God. We're honored to know you as our personal Savior, to know that our sins have been forgiven, to know that we stand complete in you, that we have been given the perfect righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that we stand, Lord, lacking nothing, complete in you. We worship you. We praise your great name that you have so favored us that you have drawn us by your Holy Spirit unto yourself. Not only, Father, do we worship you, but we give praise to your great name for the gift of your one and only Son, the blessed Lord Jesus, that willingly came to this earth, the eternal Son of God, who became incarnate in human flesh, lived among us sinlessly, did no evil, did no sin, tempted in all points like as we are, yet no sin. We have the perfect expression of the invisible God in the person of Jesus Christ. We thank you, dear Lord Jesus, that you willingly gave yourself for us, that you were willing to be persecuted, mocked, spit on, some to slap you in your face. Can you imagine slapping the face of Almighty God? But they did. But you bore it all, Father. They ridiculed you. They mocked you. They spit on you. Dear Lord Jesus, they put a crown of thorns on your head. They beat you. They lacerated you with a cat of nine tails. They put you on a Roman cross and crucified you and put you to death. They took a spear and rammed it through your heart and then laughed at you. If you be God, they said, come down from that cross. But oh, I thank you, dear Father, that you laid your life down for us as a servant of Almighty God. And I praise you that there is life in the name of Jesus to those who will look and be saved. All the ends of the earth look to Jesus and be saved. We remember tonight, Father, what you did thousands of years ago that has ramifications that will last throughout eternity. We are the redeemed of the Lord, and I reflect on that song, dear Father, that said, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing our great Redeemer's praise. As we partake of the table tonight, Lord, the symbol of your broken body, the bread, we do it in honor of you. We do it because we love you, because of what you have done for us and for the wonderful gift of eternal life. So we bless your name and give praise to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, knowing full well what was coming, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. David's going to say the, the prayer for the cup. Yeah, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we've heard so many wonderful things about you tonight. Lord, and we want to tell these wonderful things to everyone we meet, Lord, but we can't do it without your Holy Spirit filling us to all its fullness, Lord. So I do pray that for everybody here, 
Lord, this is too good to, to keep hidden. This light is too bright, Lord, to keep under a lampshade. Lord, so many animals were sacrificed for thousands of years, and then John the Baptist said, Behold, here's Jesus. He is going to be the Lamb of God that's going to take away the sins of the world. Once and for all, no more sacrifices. Lord, at the cross, that was it. Lord, and then he rose from the dead, and, and he's commissioned everybody in here to carry this message that no one can be saved without hearing it and then believing and receiving Jesus Christ. So, Lord, just help us to to take our salvation that we have gladly received, Lord, and, and pass it on. Lord, but we know it's difficult. Lord, but nothing's impossible for you, so fill us, Lord. We know you're, you have sealed us, but Lord, I just pray you would fill us, Lord, but that we're all we can think about and prioritize is just telling all that we've heard tonight, this gospel that we've heard. Uh, to others. Well, that's why we're here. Well, that's why you've left us here. Lord, we love you so much. We adore you. I pray that uh, we would return to our first love, Lord, which is you, if, if need be. But Lord, we would, I pray everyone in here would just fall more manly in love with you, Lord, because you're worthy. Just thank you now for this cup. In Jesus' name, amen. And Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Let's drink the cup together. And as often as, as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we are proclaiming the Lord's death, proclaiming the gospel until he returns and he will. I think we have a, a closing song. As we close, can we stand together? Sometimes it causes me to tremble.